Hello, everyone. My name is Ziad Ali from St. Francis Hospital and Heart Center and the Cardiovascular Research Foundation. And today I'm going to be talking to you about the principles of IVL and its unique mechanism of action. These are my disclosures. Somewhere back in 2009, on a Sunday evening in an hourly rental lab in Mountain View, California, we did some of the first experiments investigating whether IVL may have any utility in interventional cardiology. These are eggs that were bought either from a Safeway, a local grocery store, or um, from John Adams, the brainchild of uh, Shockwave's ranch, uh, filmed using an iPhone 1. And what you'll see is we basically put together a lithotripter, and some of the things that we heard during this video was it's doing something. Looks like it blew a hole in the back side that we're seeing on the front side is the membrane, and I think this is going to work. Anytime you're doing any device development, if you hear the term, I think this is going to work, that's generally a good thing. One of the key images is actually here on the right side where you see the lithotripter. We drilled a small hole to get the lithotripter inside of the egg, and it's blown away the outer shell of the egg, but the membrane is completely intact on the inside. This was, in fact, the eureka moment. And some 11 years later, shockwave intravascular lithotripsy has been finely refined uh, using a mechanism by which expanding and collapsing vapor bubbles create these short bursts of acoustic pressure waves. These acoustic pressure waves travel through the vessel effectively with approximately 50 atmospheres of pressure. But there's a unique feature of these 50 atmospheres, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later on. This creates a localized field effect within the vessel, and it fractures both superficial and deep calcium. Now, to understand the mechanism of action of intravascular lithotripsy, you need to understand a little bit about extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy, ones used for renal stones, which have been used for a long time on which coronary and peripheral IVL is adapted. Essentially, what you have on the left panel is a spark plug, and that spark plug basically creates an electric pulse between two electrodes and creates an arc. And the energy from that arc goes from being unfocused to focused using a parabola. And what that means is something like a flashlight, if you look on the inside of a flashlight, there's all those mirrors. Those mirrors focus unfocused light so that you can get a beam. And by focusing this energy, you can get a sudden burst of energy which you see on the right-sided graph with a very short rise time, a sudden increase in pressure, and this is followed by secondary waves, which actually have a negative tensile strength, and then finally a secondary rise. Now, there are many mechanisms by which intravascular lithotripsy creates fractures. The most predominant one is actually the compressive stress, which is released as the shock wave expands and collapses and releases the energy which squeezes the stone or squeezes the calcium. Subsequently, the shear stress goes through the calcium as it propagates and creates small jets which actually lead to further fracture. Small stress, which is the reflection at the end of the calcium, actually is a wave reflection that pulls the calcium in Finally, there's tensile stress, which leads to cavitation, which causes micro jets, sudden bursts of these jets, which cause these small microfractures. And finally, there's an impedance difference from the outside soft tissue and the inside of the calcium, which is hard, which leads to a squeezing effect. Taken together, these lead to calcium fracture. And used clinically, intravascular lithotripsy, we inflate a balloon at four atmospheres, this creates this vapor bubble, which leads to those compressive forces followed by the small stress and the shear stress that impacts the calcium, fracturing it and improving vascular compliance at six atmospheres. Now, there are a few fundamental differences between extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy and intravascular lithotripsy, and they're highlighted here on this graph on the left. The most fundamental difference is you'll see the blue line which is the intravascular lithotripsy, is actually magnitudes lower energy than extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. And why that might seem a little bit counterintuitive 
In fact, this is what allows the safety of IVL. Because if we had very, very high energies, it could pulverize the calcium and actually cause coronary perforation. And if we look over here on the right side, what you'll notice is that the fundamental differences between extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy is that in IVL, the energy is much lower and unfocused. The peak positive pressure is approximately 50 atmospheres. The negative or peak negative acoustic pressure is three atmospheres. That's important because that's the spall stress, which is pulling the calcium from the edge of the adventitia. So you don't want it to pull the adventitia in and create a perforation. The depth is approximately three to seven millimeters. So it can impact superficial and deep calcium, but not impact, for example, bones. And the predominant mechanism of action is in fact compression stress. Now, another important mechanism of action is pulse management, whereby you'll see that the optimal sizing of the balloon is very, very critical. And what happens in this optimal sizing is that the balloon should be 1.1 to one ratio against the artery, because the larger the balloon, the greater the field effect. In fact, if you have an undersized balloon, which is in poor contact or sort of floating within the artery, much of the energy from the IVL is actually dissipated within the liquid interface against the wall. Finally, what's critical is to understand the spatial differences of the different IVL catheters because the maximum amount of energy comes completely circumferential or perpendicular to the electrode itself. And here at the bottom, you can see when you use optimal technique, compared to suboptimal technique, there's a significantly better clinical outcome. Now, as I mentioned before, there are subtle differences between the different catheters used for the coronary, below the knee, and above the knee. And what this really has to do with is the number of channels that transmit the energy to the wall. Here in the coronary, you see two channels, which are diametrically opposing pairs. They're 180 degrees from each other. So the energy is focused in one direction, in one electrode, and the other in the other, but radiates in a circumferential manner. What you'll also notice is that the maximum amount of energy is immediately perpendicular to the electrode. Here on the M5, you'll notice that there's one field effect which is considerably larger than the others. And the reason for this is because this channel in the middle of the M5 gets its own wire. And as a result, the atmospheric pressure that's generated by this electrode is almost double that of the other electrodes which have to split the channel and thus the energy. The fundamental details of the M5, S4, and C2 catheter, including their sheath compatibility, working length, and crossing profiles are displayed here in the table. Now, ultimately what happens is the mechanism action creates a single pulse and actually, as this acoustic pressure wave collapses and creates a cavitation bubble, that cavitation bubble collapsing releases that compressive force, which is the predominant mechanism of action for fracture. There are important features to understand about the coronary balloon. And that is the, from the end of the balloon or the radiopaque marker, the first electrode or emitter is two millimeters in. Then there's a six millimeter gap followed by another two millimeter gap, and finally the final radiopaque marker. So the spaces between these markers are four millimeters to the first electrode, six millimeters to the second electrode, and two millimeters to the radiopaque marker. And what that does is it really provides an important mechanism of action for intravascular lithotripsy. And that is that IVL is hard on hard and soft on soft. And this is because of the differences in the impedance properties of tissues. The impedance property of fat or muscle or soft tissue is very, very similar to water, but hard tissue, bone or calcium is orders of magnitude, maybe eight to 10 fold higher than that of soft tissue. And so ultimately what you end up with is this type of mechanism. On the left side, you have IVL, which is like a karate chop. And on the right side, what you have is a high pressure balloon, whereby it's a long sustained pressure, 
which does not have the same sudden burst impact on being able to fracture calcium. And what you'll also notice is that there are multiple planes within which calcium fracture occurs, not simply the ones that we're used to seeing on OCT. Here in this micro CT, what you'll notice is that while there are indeed longitudinal fractures, you also see what look like calcium chips. And this is because some of the other stresses that I've showed earlier, such as the shear stresses and such as the tensile stresses, which can lead to these microjets, which can lead to smaller chips of calcium, which nonetheless can improve vascular compliance. But this is what we're used to seeing. We're used to seeing these circumferential calcium fractures on OCT, which lead to an increase in luminal gain in a dramatic fashion. And here in this example, what you'll see in this data, which shows that pre-procedure compared to post-IVL, there's a significant gain in the minimal lumen area. And what that does is actually lead to a fracture, which can then be further expanded by the stent, which ends up holding this space open, which ultimately fills with fibrous tissue. And that's what allows the very large increase in luminal gain. We showed the disrupt CD1 and 2 OCT substudies that the more the calcium, the greater the number of fractures and the greater the efficacy of the IVL on stent expansion. More recently, Richard Schlockmitz showed in the disrupt CD3 OCT substudy that in fact, even those vessels which didn't have as much fractures, there was still an excellent expansion, suggesting that some of these other mechanisms, such as the chips, um, may be in, it, it, inducing or augmenting uh, lesion preparation and vascular compliance. So the components of the shockwave, uh, shockwave IVL are simple. It's essentially a balloon connected via a catheter, which connects to a console. The console is battery powered and creates the energy and a simple push button delivers the energy at one hertz for a maximum of 80 pulses in the coronary circulation. Well, another advantage, of course, is that the IVL does not require side branch protection. You could leave a wire in the side branch if you want, and it's compatible with any guide wire with just slightly larger crossing profile than a non-compliant balloon. So in summary, IVL utilizes electrical energy to generate acoustic pressure waves which impact calcium. The acoustic pressure impacts calcium by multiple mechanisms, and compared to ESWL and ISWL, IVL energy is lower in keeping with its goal to fracture but not pulverize calcium. Adequate balloon size is critical to effective IVL, substantiating the utility of intravascular imaging in calcium. Understanding the spatial placement and separation of the IVL electrodes can help with case and pulse management. The mechanism of calcium fracture is an acoustic pulse, which is short and sharp, and in vitro and in vivo studies confirm calcium fracture as the mechanism of this improved compliance. And as such, IVL is certainly going to be an important tool in the modification of coronary artery calcium. Thank you very much for your time.